Okay, folks, so we're going on the tour. So, <laughs> we're going into a bunker. It's going to be pretty cool, I think. So, um, yeah, uh, like I say, it's just interesting the way things happen sometimes. Um, but, yeah, so, there we go, into the bunker. So, that's pretty cool, man. how the tour works. I spent a few minutes here above ground explaining to you the uh, history of RF Uxbridge and some of the things you see around you. We then go underground into what's called the plotting room where I explain what that room was used for. Uh, we then show you a short film about the Battle of Britain, lasts for 20 minutes. And finally we take you up into the museum area where you can look around at the artefacts and spend however long you want to um, viewing them. Overall it takes about uh, an hour and a half, two hours to do the tour. Um, I will say to you that because you're mostly adults, apart from this young man here, it will be the adult tour and that, yeah, I hope he won't get too bored, but if he does, I'm sure we'll be able to find ways of keeping him amused. I should also warn you that from a health and safety point of view, we're going into an underground bunker, which is down 76 stairs. It won't surprise you to know there are 76 stairs coming back up again. <laughs> so, so you need to be aware of that, and obviously anybody that's got if difficulties, and I see a young lady there is carrying a stick, I hope that's okay, the stairs. There's plenty of resting places if you need to take a rest. Um, also, while we're underground, the shape of the building is a rectangle, and if we have the alarms go off for any reason, there are two entrances. The one we'll be using, which is here on my right, and then the diagonally opposite corner of that rectangle is the alternative exit. Um, so that's uh, the health and safety information. I've just seen a car pull up, so if I'm just going to pause and see who gets out of this car. Okay, so it's another set. It was a German mercenary soldier fighting in the late 1600s, and him and his two sons helped William of Orange become King William III of, of England, and also helped him win the Battle of the Boyne in uh, 1692 in Northern Ireland. For the, their efforts, they were awarded this estate as hunting grounds, and they built a stately home at the end of the road here. You went past a, a building which is now boarded up. That was the site of their originally stately home. Um, that is now, um, th their house burned down in 1845. His sons had no children. The property fell into different ownership. The house that burned down in 1845 was replaced by the building you see there now. But to bring matters up to, to date, in 1915, the British government bought this estate of several hundred acres of land back for £30,000. Plenty of bad deal in sort of West London, £30,000 for a couple of hundred acres. How much would it be now? About two and a half million. Two and a half million? million. Yeah, so still quite a good deal. Plan was it was going to become a prisoner of war camp for German POWs, um, but the local population, who were a bunch of nimbies, didn't like that idea, <laughs> and it became a convalescent hospital for Canadian soldiers. So Canadian soldiers were accommodated in that White House and the huts in the grounds for them to also uh, be used to recover from their injuries. <clears throat> Um, in 1917, the predecessor to the Royal Air Force came onto the estate to set up a gunnery training school. And um, if you know the area, if you're familiar with the area, on the old side of the camp, by the old main entrance, there's a sort of two-storey building looks a bit like a small church. That is the original gunnery training school. Later in life, it became the first ever cinema in Uxbridge, the Camp Cinema, and also the Camp Gymnasium. <coughs> it's going to be retained in the development that's taken place as a museum for the town of Uxbridge. In 1918, the Royal Air Force was created and the RAF Uxbridge became what was known as Number One Depot, a place where people would come to join the Royal Air Force, go through their basic square bashing, learning how to clean the toilets, polish their shoes and all the kind of things people do when they join the uh, services. Um, and that's how the camp developed. 
it's never been a flying station, there's never been an aircraft come through, it's never had an airfield, it's always had back office functions. So after the First World War, it moved on, it became um, the home of the Royal Air Force Central Band. A hospital was built here where Douglas Bader was treated when he lost his legs in a flying accident in the early 1930s. Uh, it was the home of the Royal Air Force Ceremonial Marching Organisation, today called the Queen's Colour Squadron, and various other legal services and the RF police and all sorts of other odd pods have been here. The reason why people come here today, of course, is more to do with the Second World War. In that context, the history starts in the um, <coughs> mid-1930s, when the RAF was divided into Fighter Command, Bomber Command, Coastal Command and other commands. And this is the headquarters of Number 11 Group Fighter Command. Air Vice Marshal Park, who was the officer commanding, had his office in the White House at the end of the road. And the bunker that we're going into underground was uh, previously located in this white building to my left here. Uh, but being above ground, was recognised was exposed to enemy attack and was buried underground in 1939. It's just while I wait for these people to join, I will say that white building, you're among the last people to see this building, it's going to be demolished in the next few weeks and we're going to have a brand new visitor centre. Part of the, the development of the same place here is for a, a much more um, glitzy uh, sort of you know, um, tourist facility. I, I think it's a shame, I think that building's got a lot of character, mm -hmm. but the decision's been made to make it a conference centre. Just let me pause now.